Welcome to Terror at Collinwood. I am very excited to get to today's episode with Amanda Desiree and Stephen R. Shutt as we discuss The Dreamers, the novel that inspired the Dream Curse storyline in Dark Shadows. And then we're going to dive into some uh, symbolic explanations for some of the different imagery in the Dream Curse in the show as well. Uh, so we're going to have a lot of fun with this. And we're going to dive into a very obscure novel that inspired one of the storylines in Dark Shadows. Before we get to that, though, I want to touch on a couple of things. In the last episode I did with Nick Caputo, um, I made a mistake. I said that John Harkins played three characters on Dark Shadows. He actually played four characters on Dark Shadows, and I knew this, but I totally spaced on Mr. Strack, of course, uh, during the Leviathan storyline. He was an agent of the Leviathans. When they uh, showed the flashback to 1949, we saw uh, Mr. Strack meeting with Paul Stardard at the Blue Whale, making uh, making a bargain with Paul Stardard. So uh, Mr. Strack was uh, visually was in uh, episode 900. He was also in his voice. It was episode eight ni- in episode 899. So he was technically in two episodes of the show during the Leviathan's storyline. But you actually see him in uh, in that flashback sequence at the Blue Whale. Really cool uh, scene as well during that episode. So I don't know how I spaced on that, but certainly John Harkins was uh, memorable in that role as well. So a few people called that out. I just wanted to set the record straight there. John Harkins played four characters, not three characters in Dark Shadows. It happens, alas, and the older I get, the more often it happens, uh, I'm afraid. So it it could very well happen again. (laughs) And also, uh, one or two people mentioned Elizabeth Ice. We talked about her portrayal um, of Buffy Harrington in the show. I am aware that she played two other characters in the show as well. She played Nell Gunston in the Leviathan storyline, also uh, an acolyte of the Leviathans and a victim of Barnabas Collins, uh, and then she appeared as Mildred Ward in uh, 1840 as well, uh, three episodes in 1840. She was uh, the daughter of Mordecai Grimes and the wife of the constable, Jim Ward. So she was in three episodes. They are very uh, suspicious of witchcraft. She believed that Quentin was a warlock, but yeah, definitely was aware of those other characters played by Elizabeth Ice. Another one we did talk about that I ended up cutting out of the episode because I I couldn't remember the character's name was uh, Bob O'Connell also playing uh, Mr. Mooney, the innkeeper at the Eagle. I remember that he was in 1795 as the bartender too. Of course, Bob the bartender in the present day, but he also, his counterpart in 1795 was Mr. Mooney. We did talk about that, but I ended up chopping that. But yes, he played another character in the show too. The the premise of the episode was to discuss favorite minor and supporting characters. So not necessarily every character played by a specific actor, but our favorite of those minor and supporting characters. Although I did, to be fair, I did mention, as we talked about Ezra Braithwaite, I did also mention Otis Green. So uh, I was referencing other characters played by actors who came back multiple times. So I, I should have done that across the board with everybody. So thank you to those who pointed that out uh, for both Elizabeth Ice and for John Harkins. And that that one was my bad. That was a mistake. Uh, I said he played three characters. He played four. I totally spaced on Mr. Strack. Can you feel my shame? I lost at least two and a half Dark Shadows points for that. Shame, shame, shame. And uh, with that said, let's get to the show. to hide. This podcast is fun, but there are spoilers inside. Beware of dreams, Barnabas, of yours and of those of everyone about you, because that is the way the curse will return to you again. It will be a dream curse. A dream curse. Yes. 
Welcome to Terror at Collinwood. I am Penny Dreadful, shedding my true form in order to become Danielle. And I am joined once again by the wonderful Stephen Arshut and Amanda Desiree. They are returning to the podcast. They're talented writers and longtime fans of Dark Shadows and all things spooky. Welcome back to the show, both of you. Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you both back again. Um, uh, now, before we, we get into our, our topic today, um, which is uh, something different. We, I haven't done this before on the podcast, but we're going we're gonna to try to unpack uh, this, uh, this inspiration for one of the Dark Shadows storylines. But before we get to that, uh, you're both writing some uh, very interesting things. Amanda, you just had a novel published called In the Shadow of the Skull, which takes a really interesting look at uh, uh, an overlooked aspect of the King Kong story. So can you talk a little bit about your new book. Thank you, Danielle. Yes, In the Shadow of the Skull is my attempt to tell the story of King Kong from the point of view of the islanders. Specifically, my main character is the young woman who was first chosen as the Bride of Kong before Andero arrived on the island. I wanted to get into her head and, and see what she thought about everything that was happening during the ceremony after. We seldom see the long-term repercussions of Kong's attack on the village. What happened to their society after it was removed from the island? What was their society like before the intruders came and, and changed everything? Uh, so this is a, an epic length story. It's delving into the substance of their culture, who these people were. They're basically red shirts in the movie, just the people getting stomped on and, and bitten in half. I wanted to find out who they were as characters. And so that's what In the Shadow of the from Ink Shares called Webster. And it's a follow up to Smithy, my novel that was released in 2021. Wonderful. And where can we get this? Uh, they'll all be available through Amazon and through Barnes and Noble and through local bookstores if you ask them to order. Um, In the Shadow of the Skull is currently only available as an ebook. I'm working on having a hard copy available later in the month. Fantastic. Well, I'll, I will absolutely put a link on to, um, to it in the show notes. Uh, and I, I did uh, purchase one recently, but I have not read it yet, but I did, uh, I did snag one. Um, Steve, how about you? I know that uh, Stuart Manning is releasing issue two of Daytime Gothic, which is in the works. And uh, speaking of Gothic, you uh, are uh, contributing a piece to that. You're rewriting it, as I recall. So could you talk a little bit about that? I don't know how much you can say about it, but a, a little, a few tidbits would be nice. Well, thank you for having me on again. And uh, congratulations, Amanda, on the publication of your novel. It sounds really cool. And it's too long since I last saw King Kong. So it's a, I might have to watch the movie again, um, which would be a pleasure. Um, so the next issue of Daytime Gothic is going to be something that um, Dark Shadows fans are going to be really excited about. Um, and my contribution isn't <laughs> part of what's going to make people really exciting, uh, excited, but um, Stuart um, very kindly invited me to, um, uh, back in the 90s, I had written something about um, Grayson's first six months on Dark Shadows, the introduction of Julia storyline, and um, he had a memory of it that it was a really outstanding piece. And I thought I had the original article, but um, when I looked at my files, I only had like some drafts and I actually don't even really remember sending it to him. But, you know, we sometimes we have these these episodes of our lives that that disappear into the ether. So uh, it was really quite a thrill it was. Um, Interesting because I was an original. I did did run home or took the bus home from school to watch Dark Shadows, but I started in June of 1968. So the first time I ever saw the 1967 storyline was in syndication in 1976, and it was kind of a shock to me because Barnabas was so nasty and mean and julia started out being a scientist resolutely dedicated to the pursuit of truth but quickly became one of the most deceptive tricksterish <laughs> twisted characters on the show and so it was fascinating to go back and try to trace 
all of this and then think about where the show went on after the 1795 storyline was really a reboot so um so it's it's like a lot to delve into and part of it is because dark shadows ate story for breakfast so yeah. the <laughs> were constantly scrambling to uh come up with mm -hmm. more to do which i think is part of what we're going to talk about today with the dream curse storyline yes which is when you started watching it that was that was during that time right yes indeed and um i have tremendous sentimental fondness for that 1968 storyline because of that and cassandra and nicholas are two of my absolute favorite characters on dark shadows so a lot of fans feel lukewarm at best about the storyline but it's always been a strong favorite of mine yeah uh how about you amanda what are your thoughts on the on the dream curse storyline I thought that period was very tedious in terms of the storytelling. Nicholas is a wonderful character. Professor Stokes is a wonderful character. And they are the highlights of 1968. Uh, but the dream curse was very repetitive, very drawn out. Um, even the surrounding stories, Adam listening to the tape recorder ad nauseum, Elizabeth fretting about being buried alive. It just seemed like it was was not as vibrant as 1795 had been. My very first song parody at the Dark Shadows Festivals. So it'd be nice to revisit today. We're going to be talking, actually, uh, I did I did an episode a while back with um, Rich Hanley on the uh, Dream Curse and uh, Adam and Eve storyline. And we, we dove into that specific storyline. But today we're going to take a, a look at it from a, a different perspective. We're actually going to look at the inspiration for the dream curse storyline there it is the it is called the dreamers uh it is a novel uh by roger uh manvell and was published in 1957. now uh just a little bit of background here a lot of dark shadows fans um are certainly familiar with the famous uh, inspirations for Dark Shadows storylines from the uh, our, our, our beloved Rolodex of horror uh, <laughs> used by by the writers uh, and Dan Curtis on, on Dark Shadows, where they were uh, supposedly Dan Curtis had hired a speed reader to summarize uh, all of these classic tales of, of terror and uh, that the writers were using as inspiration for various storylines. And uh, of course, we know the Draculas and the Frankensteins and the Dr. Jekylls and Mr. Hyde and Tales of Poe and all of this. But um, the Dream Curse, a lot of fans for many years believed this was an original story that was uh, con concocted by the uh, Dark Shadows writers. Uh, however, it was actually uh, inspired by an obscure novel called The Dreamers. It, this was this was kind of uh, uh, muddied by the Dark Shadows Almanac, which listed some of the inspirations for Dark Shadow storylines and listed a story called The Dream Deceivers, author unknown as the inspiration for the Dream Curse storyline. Um, there is no such story. Uh, it does not exist. Uh, many, uh, several, uh, you know, scholars, etc., looked, horror aficionados, looked, tried to find this Dream Deceivers story. It doesn't exist. Um, this information about the dreamers has been under our noses the entire time. Some fans are did already know about it uh, because at the first Dark Shadows Festival in 1983, uh, the guest at the festival was Ron Sprout, the, one of the writers for Dark Shadows during this period. And someone asked him, uh, uh, and he told the audience the Dream Curse storyline was inspired by a novel called The Dreamers. So, and there are many novels entitled Dreamers. So some fans, uh, you know, dug around and they found uh, the uh, the novel, uh, this novel by Manvel. Uh, and just a quick review from Goodreads. Uh, five inhabitants of a village near London are subjected to the same dream. After one has told it to the other and the fifth dreamer nearly becomes its victim. The tracking down of its power, its source, and its lethal potential is entrusted to Dr. King. And through his handling of the five... Uh, the evil effects are dispersed and your relationships come into being not before sleeping. Um, I suspected there there had to be some inspiration for this storyline because there were there were, it just it felt like like all of the other all of the major dark shadows storylines seem to pull from some existing classic literature, classic film. And 
Dan Silvio of Shadows of the Night is the one who pointed me in the direction of the Ron Sprout information. He said, it was right on the Dark Shadows wiki. I didn't even, I should have thought to look there first. So were either one of you, before we talk about this, were I, either one of you aware of this novel at all, The Dreamers? It's obscure. No, I was not. No, yeah. I never heard about it. Um, so I was fascinated. I had to get it immediately and read it. Yeah, same here. I think maybe one of the reasons uh, in the almanac that it says the dream deceivers, I was trying to figure out why they would put that in there. They may have misheard Ron Sprout and just kind of slurred the dreamers into dream deceivers, uh, or maybe they were trying to cover, not really put that information in there because the dreamers is not in the public domain. Uh, it was published in 1957 <laughs> and uh, Dark Shadows by when... Uh, this uh, storyline ran, it had only been 11 years since this novel was published, so maybe they didn't want to really get put that out there. <laughs> they were, they were pull, pulling from a, a, a non-public domain source. Um, so tonight we're, we're going to take a look at this novel. Uh, we're going to take a uh, look at the similarities and differences uh, here when we're looking at the, the storyline. Before we get into it, Steve, you were kind enough to put together some extensive notes uh, here uh, about this or some key points. So do um, you want to give us a, a quick uh, just rundown here of um, of some of the characters in this novel? Um, okay, well, um, we were going to begin by noting that the character of Dr. Aminu King, who um, Dark Shadows turned him into Professor Stokes, mm -hmm. and Professor Stokes was also introduced in the 1968 storyline. And he's also one of my favorite characters. And um, so um, in the um, the Dreamers novel, his role is an opportunity for the author to explore some issues that have to do with colonialism and racism and how the British Empire um, kind of did or did not deal with those things and the author it's like really a remarkable book for 1957 in the light of today's um culture people who are attuned to um, issues of diversity equity and anti-racism would find a lot of the language around this problematic but it's kind of not relevant to our discussion here and if we started to talk about it, we'd spend a long time discussing it. But um, it's it starts out with a woman who's the village postmaster in this village in England, and people who are Anglophiles would know, but nobody else would know that the village postmaster usually runs a general store and has a little desk at the back where they sell stamps and things like that, and. Um, it's not clear at the beginning, but one day this mysterious African guy comes into the village and it's the 1950s in England. So if anybody who doesn't look sort of um, white and depleted shows up, it's blatantly obvious. And her encounter with him is very terrifying. And what she doesn't realize is he puts her in a post-hypnotic trance, which is a very dark shadows kind of thing. And when she goes home that night, she has the first dream. And there were certain um, incidents and in how the dreams are described in the book that were carried over into the Dark Shadows storyline. And some of the actors in Dark Shadows did a better job of acting it out than, than others did. I won't name names, but some actors, um, when they're in the dream, they're like pushed along by invisible forces. And the one that's closest is actually Maggie Evans, um, played, of course, by Catherine Lee Scott, where she tries to scream and nothing comes out. And that's actually mentioned in the book. The first woman mm -hmm. who has the dream is so disturbed, she tries to scream and nothing will come out. And then that makes her even more terrified. Um, in uh, The Dreamers, five people have the dream rather than 10 on Dark Shadows. But like I said at the beginning, they constantly needed more story on Dark Shadows. So they were constantly having to come up with more things so they could write all these episodes. And in The Dreamers, um, 
it's pretty so it's also like not like in the dark shadows version it always goes female to male in the dark shadows version but in the dreamers version first she tells her friend who's also a woman and then her friend tells her husband and it's it's not like there's no beckoner so they added that yeah element, yep. which is a very effective dramatic thing that they added in dark shadows and um that it but it's interesting that in the dreamers it's the point of the dream is to wreak vengeance upon somebody who has been wronged uh yep. who has who has wronged another in a situation um that involves a kind of thwarted romance and uh but it's like much more sick and twisted even than the one in dark shadows mm -hmm. and then um another thing to bring out is that it's said a couple of times in the dreamers that what creates the fear in each person who has the dream is not really the power of witchcraft or the devil but it's the the evil the word evil is used within each person the author takes the view that we all have some impulse towards evil within us mm -hmm. and the dream taps into that and and works on it and expands it and so the fear builds up more and more and more and then there's another element the final person to have the dream before the situation reaches its dramatic climax is initially thought to be dead by the doctor who examines her and then another doctor comes and realizes oh she's not dead she's actually in a coma and again i thought that was a very dark shadows touch yeah disturbing too because the com they're just frozen they're just, it's it's eerie the way it's uh, it's described um they were like in the in a state of paralysis her face <laughs> frozen in fear yeah 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 <laughs> um amanda you um, did a presentation uh, for at the Anne Radcliffe conference on um, the this subgenre of horror, um, the the contagious curse. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, contagious curse was the term that I find for a series of stories where I saw a similar pattern being enacted, uh, as in the dream curse. Some form of death is passed person to person sometimes it's passed through the use of object in the story casting the runes or the film curse of the demon also known as night of the demon it's a sheet of runes that's traded from person to person in the Great bottle imp by robert louis stevenson it's a sort of a genie in the bottle that brings the curse from person to person you have to sell the bottle to some then they have interaction um, it follows the curses past like a sexually transmitted disease and in the latest film, Smile, that came out last year, um, the evil is transmitted by somebody who witnesses a crime. So in the dream curse, it's passed verbally. Somebody tells their beckoner what they saw in the dream, and then that person carries the dream. And ultimately, the conclusion of this curse is that the person dies. When I was doing my research, I was trying to find if there was some urtext for the types of stories that there was some floor um, that lay at the foundation of each of these types of stories, or if you, each author was subsequently copying another story that they had admired. And what I determined is that these stories are very similar to um, religious purgation rituals. I, I use the references to sin eating. Um, in some European cultures and in parts of this deep south, who would take on the sins, the evils of the deceased person by eating a meal that was either placed on the corpse or placed near the corpse. And this would symbolically transfer the sins from the dead person to the sin eater, making the sin eater a kind of scapegoat. We also have the literal scapegoat ritual, uh, Yom Kippur, where, where you transmit the sins of the people into a goat and then set the goat to the wilderness to, to be killed. Um, so I see stories as a form of transmitting evil. Uh, like Dave was referring to, there's evil inside of us who want to get the evil out. The evil is symbolized by imminent death, and that can be conveyed to a scapegoat or conveyed to another person in this manner. You reminded me of, uh, over, we were talking over email, and when I think about one of the other storyline of subplots in Dark Shadows, the, the Jeb and the Shadow, the Pursuing Shadow, 
I always think of M.R. James as casting the runes or curse slash night of the demon, but you reminded me of he cometh and he passeth by, uh, by uh, the Wakefield story. Um, that one, H.R. Uh, Wakefield, that one is closer, even which that one is a descendant or, or an homage to, uh, to casting the runes, but that one is actually closer to the Dark Shadows storyline. Uh, so that must have been the inspiration for that shadow. I, I think more, even more so than the M.R. James story. Yes, I think it's kind of a combination. He cometh and he passeth by. The the evil is transmitted. You cut out a, a image of a demon from a sheet of paper and stick it on the person you want to kiss. You've got the shadow. You're doomed. And Dark Shadows took the route that M.R. James took. That you can pass it to somebody else or pass it back to the person who cursed you. So so Jeb is able to curse Nicholas by sticking the shadow on him instead. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, the, the, so the shadow, the, the little paper image comes from Russell Wakefield. Yeah, and it's even described as a, a shadow that, it, 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 an ever growing shadow as it as yeah. the story progresses. Yeah, I forgot about that one. I always think of, I always go back to to casting the runes, but that's certainly um, uh, one that I think that was in the uh, horror Rolodex. Um, but let's let's go get back here to the dreamers. Um, uh, Steve touched on some of the similarities between the Dark Shadows storyline and um, and the dreamers and some of the differences as well. Certainly, Dark Shadows did not incorporate the commentary on on racism in in Great Britain and colonialism, et cetera. that that aspect obviously was not incorporated into uh, the Dark Shadows storyline. However, the, just the way the the way the dream curse works, um, even the name, the dream curse, uh, the 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 name of the curse itself is that's what they call it in the dreamers. They call it the dream curse several times. One of the chapters, I think chapter six, is entitled the dream curse, and uh, it works in much the same way. Um, someone has the dream, and they when when they wake up they become obsessed with it they they are burdened with this dream and it it, it uh, causes them great distress in, in increasingly so until they unburden themselves by telling it to someone now they don't see uh the there's no beckoner as steve steve pointed out they don't see the next person in the dream it's basically whoever the first person is that they they have a conversation with they they have, they are compelled to tell them the dream and pass the dream along. And with each dream, it goes a step further. It goes a step further. Uh, and then it ultimately, when it reaches its intended victim, it kills them. But as we learn, it puts them in this kind of frozen state. They look dead, but they're not actually dead. But um, the, the someone sets the curse with the uh, in the in the novel. We find out who it is, and um, it just progresses as it goes along. Um, any other thoughts on similarities between the two? I, I do. Yeah. In Dark Shadows, each person's personal fear was represented in the dream, whereas in the dreamers, the characters all share the same dream, but they respond differently to certain aspects of it. So for example, the, the dream features uh, walking through a forest, going over a hill and going into a house. The first person who has the dream is afraid of heights. So the experience of going up the hill is the most terrifying for her. She's afraid she's going to fall off the hill. The mm -hmm. next person who has the dream is more afraid of, I think in the book, the dream itself doesn't change very much. It does, it does go further, but there's not the addition of that personal element of fear the way that there is in dark shadows mm -hmm. uh secondly in dark shadows each person is condemned to repeat every night until they tell their beckoner about it in the dreamers the characters only experience the dream once but like you said the memory of it becomes such a burden that they can't think of anything else or function until they tell the dream to somebody else mm -hmm. and they're even instructed i think dr king uh uh, uh, you must says you must not sleep, Doctor Morgan. Uh, there's, that's the title of one of the other chapters too. You must not sleep, Doctor. He's trying to you know, get him to stay awake. He tries to stay awake because if he falls asleep, he will have the dream and it will then uh, progress or it may kill him. Um, so uh, there's that aspect as well. There's a, uh, Steve. Do you have any other similarities you want to throw out there? Um, well, one thing that's um, striking about the dreamers is the part about the dreams 
it's only like the first fifth or so of the novel. And then most of the rest of it has to do with um, this parapsychologist who yeah. has occult training because he's from some unnamed country in Africa. And um, it was interesting that in Dark Shadows, uh, I've been rewatching the Dream Curse episodes, and in one of them, Professor Stokes says, this curse is still known among certain primitive oh. societies. So that mm -hmm. is like they're pointing at whenever they talked about primitive, it usually meant Africa or South America or something like that in that period. Um, and um, I think... Um, one thing that it's kind of like an implicit theme is like Amanda was saying how the the emotions and the personal psychology of each person who has the dream plays into how the dream um, is experienced by them. And it's interesting to watch the dreams and think about which specific fear. I think only Dr. Lang says he tells julia when he's explaining when he's telling her his dream i'm afraid that what i saw means my experiment will fail yeah it's his greatest fear and i want to look at the, each of those because i think they do represent their a, a deep seated fear for each of those characters i think they do they they're we can examine each of those images symbolically and take a look at, at that i think that would be fun to look at that sure yeah. um one other thing, you pointed this out in uh, in an email. Um, uh, further note, having viewed episode 478 yesterday, script actually quotes from the Manvel novel Cassandra's prompt to Maggie includes the phrase, until the fear reaches the limit of your endurance. Uh, also, Maggie tries to scream when Jeff is beckoning her but is unable to make a sound, also mentioned in the Manvel novel. So they pulled an actual, they actually pulled a direct quote out of the, the book uh, here and, and included that in the storyline. Um, there's another um, thing that happens. Um, Professor, uh, I love Dr. King. I think he's he's a, such a great character. I really enjoyed him. There is, it's 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 an odd combination because Manville also others him a lot in the in the in the in the book, but also kind of puts him on a on a pedestal because he knows these secrets he knows how to deal with this situation he's a great character also i mean in the same tradition uh, uh in a different way but cut from the same cloth as professor van helsing of course which i think also is an inspiration for professor stokes um uh, but dr king much like uh he enters the dream curse like professor stokes does and confronts um, the person who cast the the curse in the first place, he must enter the dream in order to battle um, the, the one who cast the curse, just like Professor Stokes does. So that's another thing that's, I think, echoed in Dark Shadows that came from uh, the novel. How about, should we talk a little bit about some of the differences or do you, do, did we touch on those? Um, obviously, we talked about the, the racial aspect is not incorporated into Dark Shadows. Are there any other differences that you want to touch on before we look at some of the other um, uh, the symbolic aspects of the dream curse, I guess? Uh, one other difference, as Steve pointed out in Dark Shadows, the dream is intended to follow a specific path. Each person sees a beckoner and that's the person they're supposed to tell. Mm -hmm. uh, the the drop that occurs in the dreamers is that an innocent bystander is injured. The, the person who's the target of the dream tells it to his mistress. She's not supposed to be involved, mm -hmm. but she's the one who ends up going into the coma that everybody believes is dead. Yeah. So she's the, the unfortunate who's specifically targeted who was supposed to have the dream. So there was no chance that if, if you told the dream to somebody, they weren't automatically going to have it. It had to be a specific person. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, she she was not the intended target, uh, and yet she is the one who ultimately fell into uh, the coma. Um, we didn't talk about the reason um, the curse was cast, or who who cast the curse. Should we? Should anybody want to talk about that at all? Or, uh, I mean, it isn't really relevant to the Dark Shadows storyline, but I, we could talk a little bit about that if you like. Well, it's it's very um, interesting how it's handled. Um... If you want to read the book, it's better maybe to skip over this bit because it yeah. plays somewhat like a detective novel, mm -hmm. or a murder 
It does, yeah. That there is an injustice that is actually at the root of everything that's going on. And in Dark Shadows, we already know the situation because the 1968 storyline in Dark Shadows is the sequel to 1795. And a lot of what happens in 1968 mm. plays upon themes that were brought in in yeah. 1795. But in The Dreamers, the novel, um, it has it again has to do with colonialism and racism yeah. of people who were sent to various British colonies to do, um, in this case, um, medical work. Um, and the doctor, it's the character of um, Dr. Morgan um, in the book, had been out in one of these colonies in Africa. And it's a complicated situation. Maybe I'll just say like in outline, he had a patient the person he had the most contact with was the patient's spouse. And the man had gone to great lengths to try to get him to treat his wife. And because of his, both his racism and I would say his psychological weakness, Morgan failed to step up to the plate, as it were, and failed really horribly. And so then as a result, the um, the wife of this man dies and that's the the wrong the injustice that the mm. man swears to avenge but it's not being done out of a spirit of justice it's being done out of a spirit of vengeance paying back what was yeah. done to him and i i thought the psychological dynamics were were really interesting they're also a little bit um if you are not really comfortable with the world of the mid 20th century and how things were written about, then for some readers, I guess we would call it a content warning or a trigger warning mm. days, because uh, I, I work at a major university and we talk about these kinds of issues a lot mm -hmm. now. All, all the more so with what's been in the news recently. Sure. So, um, but it's really, I think it's very compellingly written and it's fascinating about Roger Manvel. He's mainly known for his um, work on the Nazis, on the history of the Nazis. He wrote a book about Goebbels and um, that's often cited. And, but then he became a film professor at Boston University. He moved oh. here to Boston and that was where he ended up. But when Dark Shadows was on, he was actually in England, I think in Cambridge University, getting his degree. So I'm sure he never knew, unless a friend of his in the States happened to be watching and realized, oh, guess what? They're like ripping off your novel for this <laughs> opera. I, I could I could kind of see Dan Curtis saying, oh, he'll never know. Let's <laughs> let's let's use that story, you know. Yeah, maybe he never found out, but because he was a professor of film, I think he might have been intrigued initially to know, yeah. oh, my book is being adapted. But then, you know, like there's the problem that they had with, or like they could never have done how the dream is depicted in the novel. You, you would need major, I mean, it could be done today with CGI and things like that. But in the 1960s in a TV studio, there's no way they could have, uh, no. especially Dr. Morgan's dream right. for male readers. Dr. Morgan's dream has a specific detail that may really curl your hair or make you very uncomfortable. <laughs> so the, the, uh, yeah, the dream, the way the dream plays out in the novel is, com is different. Uh, it's a, the imagery is completely different. There's no little rhyme through sight and sound and faceless terror right. that that was all made up for dark shadows. I mean, no Josette's music box, obviously, no, none, none of that. Uh, it's just the, the idea of it. And maybe it was different enough that they felt they could get away with it. Sort of like the lottery, uh, the lottery in the 1841 parallel time storyline is clearly inspired by Shirley Jackson's lottery, but it's not exactly like the lottery in the story, which was not public domain and still isn't as far as I know. Um, so, uh, you know, they, they probably felt they could get away with it by adapting it to, into their own, um, you know, world uh, there. Um, anything there's else? One, there's one other cool little facet to mention about the dream in The Dreamers. Um, the dream 
it represents like this there's this house that's at the center yeah. of it mm -hmm. and in terms of um both occult and psychological understanding the how a house is often a representation of the self mm -hmm. and um so it's very interesting that that's the motif in the dark shadows dream it's not really a place it's just this vague space with all these doors that visually i think that's very striking i think a lot of dark shadows fans were not impressed it's kind of difficult when you see the bucket with the dry ice coming out and the um, stage hand in the background. That's only in like one that you do see a stage yeah. hand actually fanning the dry ice. But um, it's cool that that um, that they tried to come up with something to correspond to the idea of a house. But I think Angelique, when she confronts Stokes, says, you will die as a statue amidst all this ruin. And it's um, that's not from the dreamers at no. all. And that's no. a really cool line. It is a really cool line. Uh, yeah. Um, Amanda, any other thoughts on uh, the dreamers? Um, not so much about the dreamers. I was just going to say the production values of the dreamers in the show a little bit to Milton Bradley, their mystery date board game. Who's behind the door? Is it going to be the headless body or the howling wolf to dance enough to, uh, to do it with their uh, limited resources? <laughs> yes, yeah. You, you were breaking up a little bit there, but I got the, I got the gist of what you were saying there, the, the mystery, mystery board game you said? Mystery date. Mystery date. Okay. Mystery date. Are you ready for your mystery <laughs> date? Don't be late. Don't be it, yes, it does have that vibe, and or a fun house, like a fun house, uh, you know, house of horrors at a carnival kind of a kind of a thing. When I was a kid, I didn't even notice the dry ice uh, and the stagehand. That that I it, I didn't notice it. I don't know why, but I just did not. I think I was just so entranced by what was happening that I didn't. I didn't I didn't notice that until I watched it as an adult and I was like, oh well, there it is. Um, but um there is a you you uh well, I guess I'll close out so, unless anybody else has anything else to say about the dreamers. Um you sent some uh great quotes here, Steve, and I'm gonna read the last one you sent here. The dream this is from the dreamers, the dream you have experienced is a concentration of evil. It was made to destroy life. The man who has made it has become very powerful because of the evil he has created inside him. And he has reached out with his mind to inflict the evil he has generated, generated upon the man he hates. Fear is the greatest enemy of life. The worst death of all to inflict on others is death through fear. For then life is led to destroy itself. The last dream is intended to take the dreamer beyond the limit of his endurance to make him destroy his own life in the agony of unendurable fear. Uh, that, that, thank you for pulling some of the quotes from the, the novel here. I wanted to, to close the dreamers discussion out with that because I think that's that's a really cool quote. And as you said, it's echoed in Dark Shadows itself. Okay, so um, let's then move on here for the second uh, half of this episode and talk about the dream curse itself. So we touched a little bit on this in terms of the symbolism in the dream curse. I do feel that each of those images is meant to symbolize something in, in dark shadows. Um, and I think you both expressed some interest in, in also in this. So uh, I, I'm going to, Steve was kind enough to break these down uh, for us for each dream, the, how each dream ends, the last thing we see in each dream. So I'm going to read these out and then I'll throw it out to either of you if you have anything you want to uh, throw out there in terms of your own um, thoughts on this speculation on what these uh, images symbolize. I'd love to hear from you on these and I'll just go through each one. Maggie has the first dream. She sees a grinning, garishly lit skull and awakened screaming. Sound of Josette's music box is part of the dream. Uh, so she sees a grinning, garishly lit skull and awakened screaming. So uh, do either one of you want to jump in? I'll get Steve and Amanda, either one of you, if you want to jump in on this. Yes, I, I actually had watched recently the Dark Shadows video scrapbook, Nightmares and Dreams Real. And one of the featured nightmares is from when Maggie was being preyed upon Barnabas. 
as he was trying to make her into his Josette, she dreams that she sees the coffin. She opens up the coffin and sees herself to become a grinning skull. So yes. I think it's very interesting the way that her dream and the dream her echo of this original nightmare from when yes. she was being to just especially down to the music boss playing in the background and the, the similar image of the skull. Agreed. I think Agreed. It, it, it's bringing back her initial fears from a earlier life. Yep, that's exactly that's that's exactly what I was going to say. I was going to say the same thing. Uh, it's an uh, episode. Uh, I, I made a note of it. Episode four seventy eight. Uh, she has a disturbing dream. Um, uh, her face becomes a skull. Um, in her unconscious mind, I think all of that is. I mean, it's all there. It's just Julia, um, you know, pushed it down so she can't remember it. But uh, her all of that is there. Uh, and that's how. It manifests in the form of death. Her her face is a, a skull, um, and the music box too. Uh, obviously, you know that that echoes uh, also what happened to her. Steve, any thoughts on that or on this one? Yeah, that was a very cool echo, and I think that dream that Maggie had back in the nineteen sixty seven storyline might have been the first use of a dream sequence of that style on Dark Shadows. And um, the bigger topic, like the use of dreams yeah. in Dark Shadows, it was so trippy. And they used them more and more and more as they went on. And um, like, you know, like I loved Quentin's dream right before he had the werewolf curse where he sees Magda with a tambourine. And I think Sandor is in there too. And it's really like something out of a, a Bertolt Brecht. <laughs> yeah. Which Grayson Hall did. Bertolt Brecht plays sometimes so like whenever I watch that one um, but it's it's just um, really cool how they made that visual reference to like one of the most terrifying things that must have been on TV in 1967 she's like looking in the coffin and then she looks up and she sees herself as a skull with yeah. like long hair screaming away and it's I'm sure that the that network standards and practices people had no idea. <laughs> like one of the production people, I think he was the PR guy or something, was in a hotel suite with somebody from the ABC executive um, board and they had dark shadows on. And it was one of those scenes where Barnabas turned to Vicky and almost bit her. And and the guy from the executive thing was like, wait, what's with his teeth? What's going on here? <laughs> they, yes, and the they weren't paying attention to dark shadows at all. Oh, it, it's just an atmospheric touch. He didn't <laughs> say, oh, we've got a vampire on one of our TV shows. You didn't know. Yeah, you would think, you know, the ABC executives would know what was going on on their on their network. But nope, they they were not really paying attention to, to that um that that image that episode uh in that 1967 episode that dream that nightmare still stays with me uh that that was very effective uh chilling uh it, that one got under my skin and it, it's still there um but uh, yeah that was a really cool call back to that um so uh the next one jeff clark sees the skull and a guillotine blade sweeping down uh, to me this one it's pretty obvious, I think, but uh, given what was going on in the storyline, but I don't know if anybody has thoughts on this that they want to throw out. Barnabas wanting Lang to use Jeff's yeah. head for the body. For, yeah, for basically. That, I think I think that was basically it. I mean, that one, that one was kind of on the nose, I think, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, Lang and Barnabas were going to decapitate uh, Jeff Clark and use his head on uh, the Adam body, which is really a bizarre like why why did they think that would be a great idea because like vicky just looks like, wow jeff you're a lot taller now <laughs> what's that His much taller twin brother from england shows up yes yeah exactly yeah <laughs> steve any other thoughts on on this one any well, just the fact that it's a guillotine, it's kind of like a look ahead. Uh, I think it was oh, yes. unintended mm -hmm. to Daniel Roger. Good call, yes. Later on. And um, the fact that she supposedly it was in love with Peter Bradford, although that's a total retcon. But mm -hmm. I mean, how can you not love a character who is proclaimed repeatedly as the most evil woman of the 18th century? Yes, yes. Absolutely. 
When I met uh, Marie Wallace uh, at Lyndhurst recently, I asked her to, uh, I got one of her photos and I got her book and I asked her to sign it and she asked how to spell my name. I said, Danielle, like, she was like, how do you spell it? I said, like, Danielle Roger. She's like, of course. And she, <laughs> she wrote it down. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, good call there, uh, with, with the guillotine and the French revolution and Danielle Roger. That's wonderful. Yeah. And, uh, okay. Um, moving on here. Um, let's see, uh, you, I mean, Dr. Lang himself, um, tells us Dr. Eric Lang sees the skull, the guillotine and the headless man while insane laughter peels onwards. Lang tells Julia, his beckoner that the headless man represents his fear that the experiment will fail. So uh, I think uh, that all plays into it, whether his fear that the experiment will fail, this headless body. Any other thoughts on this one? Not for me. No. Yeah. no? Okay. Um, okay. Moving on. Yeah. Dr. Lang tells us uh, what, what that means. Julia has the dream after Lang's death and sees the skull, the guillotine, the headless man, and a skeleton in a wig and bride's gown and veil. Thoughts on this one. It represents Josette that she can never compete with this dead bride that Barnabas still pining for. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I like that. Okay. Steve. Yeah, that's really um, a cool uh, thought about it, particularly because there's an episode in towards the end of 1967 where Julia is trying to like duke it out with the ghost of Josette in Josette's room. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also wondered if it was Julia's subconscious representation of the fact that she was in love with one of the living dead. Yeah. Uh, to really consummate that love, she herself might have had to become one of the living dead. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. I, I like Amanda's take on it. Yeah, I like I like both of those ideas. Um, I like them better than what I what I was thinking was it was sort of a prophetic dream and that she uh julia is the one who is going to create eve um you know she's going to create a bride for adam uh, uh out of body parts uh so you know this the death bride um but i i like what amanda what you said and what steve said too uh a lot more than that um it makes more sense too um mrs johnson sees the skull the guillotine the headless man the skeleton bride and giant bats uh, one of the really great uh, film uh, footage that they had of these giant you know, bats in that doorway. Thoughts on that? I, it never made sense to me what Mrs. Johnson saw. I, I think Mrs. Johnson and David should have switched dreams. He sees cobwebs and she sees bats. Yeah. Uh, David might have feared bats because Barnabas, as a vampire, had been targeting him prior to 1795. And Mrs. Johnson must clean up a lot of cobwebs at Collinwood, so I can see why that would give her nightmares as to why she sees okay. the bats instead. Maybe she has some deep-seated fear of bats that we never knew about. Okay. Or maybe it was just a good visual, as you pointed out. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. Steve, any thoughts? Yeah, that, that's a good, um, a good astute suggestion, um, yeah. Amanda. That they should that their dreams should have been switched because mm -hmm. David had been terrorized by Barnabas. Yeah. Barnabat. <laughs> Barnabat. Yeah. Um, my thought on that one is that um I I I mean bats have long been associated with the supernatural and the night. And Mrs. Johnson has certainly been uh exposed to these legends uh, living in Collinsport and now living in Collinwood for the past couple of years. So, uh, I mean, I guess symbolically, um, she, she fears the, the supernatural. She'll, she'll certainly come face to face with that in a few months when, um, with the ghost of Quentin, when she takes on the, um, uh, the Mrs. Gross role from turn of the screw there. So, um, you know, could could be uh, that too. Uh, I like the deep seated bear fear of bats specifically, though. That's kind of that's kind of fun. Um, also, I mean the I animal. Like, mm. I like your symbolic representation more. She does come across as being a little more superstitious than some of the other characters. I yeah. remember one of the episodes when Mitch Ryan was still playing Burke Devlin. He's talking to her about some of the things she's seen at Collinwood and asking her, well, "You don't really believe in in the boogeyman, do you? You don't really believe in things like that." So mm -hmm. I, I can see where you're that it, it does it does fit her character mm -hmm. okay yeah i can i can see that um and also david david sees the skull the skeleton bride the bats and a spider in a giant web in which he becomes entangled thoughts on that one 
David being so young, he doesn't have any control over his life. Maybe he feels like he's trapped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, good, good call there. Uh, Steve, what about you? Well, this is kind of a problematic period for the character of David because mm -hmm. uh, he was off the show for like, I think a couple months almost. And um, then they brought him back. And the first thing that happened to him was Cassandra struck him mute. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, it's, it's very strange how his character is during this period. Then later when the Quentin storyline begins, he begins to be more like himself. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I, I like that image of him feeling like he's caught. He's definitely caught in Cassandra's web at yeah. this particular moment. Yeah. Um, I, I, I had something similar. I, th I think David is often the target of the supernatural at uh, Collinwood. He was, when his mother came back, when Laura came back, she was going to take him into the flames. Barnabas targeted him. Cassandra struck him mute. At one point he had an, uh, an encounter with Adam, although he subsequently befriended Adam apparently and was visiting him in the in the room in the West Wing and hanging out with him, which I, I would have loved to have seen that a scene where we see David and Adam hanging out. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, But David is like the fly in the spider's web and uh, he is often the victim and will continue to be certainly as steve mentioned with with quentin coming up and then later on with the leviathans too and gerard uh, gerard and uh, daphne and all of that so I, I think david is like the fly in the spider's web and is always seems to be a magnet for these things that that seem to focus on him um the last one well not the last one but uh willie let's see willie in the dream sees the skull the guillotine the skeleton bride and a snarling wolf thoughts on this one the howling of dogs or maybe wolves always signaled that barnabas was about to rise from his coffin and that was yeah. very frightening willie in the beginning because barnabas was a was a scary violent guy yeah so i think that that calls back to the the pre seventeen ninety five evil Barnabas days, mm -hmm. definitely, yeah. Uh, Steve, yeah. Um, again, this particular period is such a weird period for Willie. Willie's uh, John Carlin's also come back to the show after a much longer absence, and um, just watching these episodes because I've watched some other episodes besides the one specifically for the dream. And I just watched an episode the other day. It was the episode where um, Joe Haskell's body shows up falling out of a closet at the old house. And and Barnabas is trying to get Willie to help him get Joe to the hospital. And Willie's saying, you know, Barnabas, Maggie really likes me. And Barnabas is like, will you stop talking gibberish? Yeah. And Barnabas is so mean yeah. to Willie. And Julia is also very mean to Willie during this period. And then Willie does, after a while, like uh, certain events that happen at the end of this particular, the dream curse thing, Willie starts to acquire some more of his own agency. But um, I also felt like the snarling of the dog might represent Willie's fear of his own aggressive impulses getting out of control. But again, I think, um, Amanda, what you suggested is much more on the mark, that it's a memory of how the dogs would howl whenever yeah. Barnabas was about to go out into the night. Yeah, uh, I, I like that, too. I, I I put that down, too. Like, I think I do think the wolf represents the, a wolf is a predator, you know, and it rep, it does, I think, represent Barnabas and Willie's the one who let Barnabas out. He's the one who let him out into the world. It ties into absolutely echoes that whenever Barnabas uh, was you know, about the bloodlust and the and the, uns the the animals were unsettled by his presence. These dogs howling and howling. Certainly, I think uh, on some level, Willie still deeply fears Barnabas. I think you know they're on on some level he you know suffered a lot at the hands of of Barnabas and knows he was one of the undead and could become that again um so absolutely um yeah and then we have let's see here carolyn hypnotized by stokes has the dream and sees the skull the guillotine and the skeleton bride it ends in her seeing her own tombstone died july 15th 1968 
thoughts on this one? I can see a couple of different interpretations. She had just watched her mother being terrified of her own death. So perhaps that's a sign that it, it's a generational fear that Carolyn also has these same fears about her impending death, especially if, if, if you take the position that she's been symbolically buried at Collinwood for most of her life, hasn't really had much of a chance to do any living and to see the, the date on the tombstone indicating that her life such as it is might be ending sooner than she thinks. That could be very frightening. Um, I wonder if it also is meant to be a red herring. At, at the time the episode aired, July 15th was not very far in the future. Perhaps the audience was supposed to believe that Carolyn was in some kind of danger, perhaps from Adam or from some other source, and wonder if maybe her character was going to be killed off if this was a precognitive. Excellent. Good. Uh, Steve? Oh, those are all really great comments. Um, I kind of thought like the most primal fear of all for many is the fear of death yeah and um she's getting close to the end of the dream curse so the fear is just becoming more kind of nitty-gritty i guess okay excellent good um uh, yeah i i agree amanda you're the, the absolutely it's you, I think you nailed it. There are fear, a fear of dying. And like Steve said, you know, it's a primal fear and fear of dying young. Uh, 1968, Carolyn was still young. So um, very good uh, observation there. Uh, Stokes confronts Angelique in the dream. Um, Sandra gives Sam Evans a potion. It, introdu it induces the dream. Vicky is his beckoner and he sees the skull, the skeleton bride and the guillotine. In the end, he sees Maggie mourning at his own funeral. Thoughts on this one? No, I think that definitely was a precognitive dream because Sam Evans dies shortly after having yeah. that dream. It's true. Yeah. 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 Steve, any thoughts? Oh, yeah, I would definitely agree. In fact, it's so similar to the Carolyn dream that it may be intended to be like that Cassandra was moving it back on track after Stokes' effort to make it terminate. Yeah. So that interaction between Cassandra and Stokes is really fascinating. I love <laughs> that. Oh, it's a great like episode. Homage, yeah. And she's it, trying to uh, give him the tobacco, the enchanted <laughs> tobacco. It's, yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, um, I, I think you're you're right. Precognitive dream there. But also, I, I think, you know, Sam fears. I mean, Maggie lost her mother. Uh, you know, he they're... He's all she has left. Uh, she, he probably fears you know, seeing her despair and not knowing what life will be for her once he's gone too. There, either she's she'll be alone, you know. Uh, so uh, there's also that uh, aspect playing into it. But I, I do think there's a precognitive um, aspect here to this dream. Um, the goal uh, and the rest of these, the the last dreams are, um, you know, we have Vicky has the dream. Barnabas is the beckoner. She sees Barnabas lying dead at the old house. Um, I mean, I I think the, the now as we get to the the climax of the dream curse there wasn't i don't know if there's so much symbolism here um it seems and then barnabas is attacked by the bat out of hell uh <laughs> in the episode that features as steve noted the slap heard around the world uh <laughs> uh any thoughts on those last two dreams i don't know if there's much symbolism there but if you have any thoughts please feel free to share them i think it's just pretty literal vicky dreams of barnabas dying and then he does so I can still remember watching those when they were first broadcast. Um, I think I watched that one, at, the one um, where he has the dream. Um, I think I was at my grandmother's house. That's what mm -hmm. I remember. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was transfixed by the slap heard around the world. <laughs> so it was such a cheerfully on. <laughs> was such a great great scene very memorable uh scene there for sure um do either one of you have any other thoughts that you want to share in, in, in terms of the dream curse the dreamers or any kind of uh symbolism you want to mention or any of that in our email discussions prior to to this show we had done some other literary works that share similarities to the dreamers or the dream curse yes. uh, steve had mentioned the room in the tower by then uh, before before you revealed that the dreamers was the source of the dream curse, I had thought that a short story 
called The Dream by A.J. Allen might have led the writers to, to take this plot line. It's also about somebody who has a recurring dream and the person who features in the dream in the beginning of the show, how the dreamers acts upon the inherent evil within each person to, to frighten them to the point of death. Uh, that reminded me of a story by Eleanor Scott called The Dream. Each person who sleeps in the so-called haunted room ends up having a terrifying dream in which they see the worst version of themselves. And it, 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 it preys on their minds. It has the same haunting effect that the dream has in the dream curse. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of these stories predate the dream curse itself. I, I wonder if any of the writers or the person who compiled uh, the horror Rolodex might have been aware of these stories or if it's just that these are similar themes uh, in the ether, in, in the collective unconscious that return mm -hmm. through story shows. Yeah, um, I, I want you mentioned a play, but you broke up when you when you said the title. What was it called? Uh, for for which story? The where the person people have the a dream that where they see the worst version of themselves. What, what was that? Oh called? yes, it's called the room. It's by Eleanor Scott. The room by Eleanor uh, Scott. Okay. We go to stay in a manor house where there's a legend about a haunted room and they take turns sleeping in the room. They think they're going to confront a ghost, but they confront their own worst selves. It's, it's a bit like Henry James Jolly Corner, where mm -hmm. they see their own worst characteristics exaggerated in such a horrific way and it haunts them. And in some cases it has a life-changing impact that they, they don't want to become that person. So they change their ways. Interesting. I'll have to, I'll have to check that out. Um, Steve, any other thoughts uh, as well in terms of uh, the dreamers or the dream curse or in other inspirations that come to mind? Um, there's a night gallery episode that also involves a woman having a recurrent dream um, played by Joanna Pettit. I think the title of the episode is The House. I mean, it's not a, it's a story within an episode. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really beautifully filmed, um, that particular one. It's quite early in night gallery. Did you that one? Hmm? What? I, th I think it was directed by John Astin. That oh, was it? Wow. Huh. It might have been huh. I'm a director in addition to one of my favorite actors. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's fantastic. I did a show with John Astin a few years ago. It was uh, called Radio Classics. It was a, um, we did a, it was a, a stage performance uh, where we did uh, readings of classic radio shows and John Aston was in it, and I got to perform with him. And and, and I love uh, my friend Irma. He was Professor Kropotkin in that, and we had scenes together, and it was surreal uh, to to be on stage with John Aston. And he, I'll, I'll put a picture. Um, he is so nice. I mean, you're just such a genuinely nice person. Uh, very down to earth and very friendly. And I mean, I was trying not to fangirl out too much talking to, to John Aston, but it was very difficult to, I had to suppress that and be professional, but he was so, so uh, nice to talk to. And I think he's still, I think he's still teaching, uh, if I'm not mistaken, John Hopkins University. I don't think he's retired. He must be in his nineties at this point, but um, he's still, uh, he's still active and just such a delight. Um, but uh, great. Well, hey, um, I, I'm so happy that the two of you were able to to join me uh, and return to the podcast to to talk about um, the dreamers and the dream curse. Um, I hope I always encourage Dark Shadows fans to check out the source material uh, to to dive into that horror Rolodex and look at the stories and films that inspired your favorite Dark Shadows storyline. So give the dreamers a look. You can find that. Uh, I, I picked this one up on Amazon on a used copy um, of it, um, the paperback. Uh, then they republished it in the, in the 60s, I, I think, uh, with a, a slightly different cover. The, the image on the cover is a little bit different for the uh, for the later version. Um, and um, Amanda's book, In the Shadow of the Skull, uh, you can also find that uh, on Amazon. I'll put a link to that in the show notes and keep an eye out for Daytime Gothics. You can see, uh, read Steve's great article on Grayson Hall. And both of you, I want to thank you for coming back. And uh, I hope to see you again soon, hopefully in person. Definitely. Well, thank you again. It was wonderful to, to see you both. And thank you very much for having me again, Danielle. Enjoy the conversation today. It was my pleasure having you back. Thanks for thanks for doing it. And Steve, thank you also for, for coming back. Thank you for having me. And I hope that nothing that has been revealed here has turned your blood to ice. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm going to put a spoiler <laughs> tag just in case it turns anyone's blood to ice <laughs> reading this, uh, hearing about this. Um, we got we got to put the spoilers on there. So this this is this novel was published in 1957, but most people listening to this probably have not read it. Uh, although I know um, Joe Escobar definitely did. He, Joe Joe sent me a PDF when I mentioned on the podcast at one point that the Dreamers was the inspiration for the Dream Course. Joe Escobar already had it scanned. He had a PDF. He sent it to me. I said, oh, "Wow, that, thank you." Joe was great. He's just amazing. I should write him and Madeline a thank you note because i really found their uh, google drive tremendously helpful oh yes yeah um uh, there's a, a google drive link joe sent it to me and madeline uh, i think madeline's the one who's curating it uh it is a google drive um uh, full of classic dark shadows fanzines uh all the world of dark shadows all uh, inside the old house and several other ones that were scanned. Uh, it's a great archive, great resource. Uh, it's important, I think, to archive that stuff. Uh, you know, uh, hopefully somebody will do that someday with Shadowgram. We just lost Marcy Robin, which was heartbreaking to hear. I was shocked to hear that. There are a lot of Shadowgrams, though. That's going to take a while to scan all, all of those, I'm sure. But yeah, it's crazy. We, we, used to, we had so many Dark Shadows fanzines back, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, even. Um, into the 2000s, we had a lot of Dark Shadows fanzines, but now, luckily, we have Daytime Gothic coming out, but, um, but that's, you know, that's it, uh, as far as I'm aware, in terms of print uh, fanzines. Well, let's hope we get some more soon. Yeah, exactly. Hey, have you ever wanted to do a Dark Shadows fanzine? Go do it. Now's your chance. Or a podcast, <laughs> like <laughs> Alan Gallant, his new Colin Sport oh, yeah. After Dark, he is for Barnabas and Bangle. <laughs> <laughs> I just watched his new episode. He just posted a new episode. It was it was really good. So please oh, check well, it out. I'll have to see it. I can't wait. It's about promotional materials. Dark Shadows promote in the fan club. The the uh, vampire, uh, Dark Shadows vampire fan club, uh, which uh, happened while the original series was on, and you could get different kits and the ghoul pad and the Barnabas bookmark and all kinds of fun stuff. So, and he shows all of that in, in his episode. So well worth checking out. Speaking of checking things out, please do remember to check out Tara at Collinwood too. Please subscribe to the podcast, rate and review. Uh, the reviews have kind of trickled, uh, trickled down here. So if you're listening to the podcast on Apple podcasts, please review Terror at Collinwood or give it a rating because that does help the podcast to reach more Dark Shadows fans. Uh, if nothing else, please share it. If you have friends who are fans of Dark Shadows and maybe they don't do podcasts, you know, hip them to Terror at Collinwood. They might, they might dig it. So please uh, let them know about it. And with that said, thank you for listening. And for as long as they lived, the dark shadows never truly vanished, for there will always be Terror at Collinwood. Terror at Collinwood is a Penny Dreadful production.